Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Parallel Systems Broadcast. We're here with Lawrence Leppard. Lawrence, you're an extremely popular market commentator and you're one of my favorites. So I'm really honored to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. How are things going today? Oh, thank you, Mike. It's it's nice to be with you and I, I, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, me too, Lawrence. Uh, and one of the first questions I wanted to get into was this year's been a really strange one in the markets. We had tightening all year long. We've got banks that were failing at the start of the year. Feels like everything's okay now, but I just don't understand how the markets are still staying up without any liquidity going into them. So I just wanted to ask your take on that. What's keeping the S&P and the NASDAQ from cratering right now? That's a great question, Mike. I, I wish I knew the answer to it, to be honest with you. I mean, some of it's the deficit spending, some of it's the buildup, you know, in terms of just, you know, there's a certain amount of money that was let go in COVID and it's, we still haven't worked our way through all of it. Uh, and I think some of it is the market actually is kind of believing the narrative that we're going to have a soft landing and that the Fed will be easing and that there'll be more monetary accommodation in the future. And you do need to remember that kind of since 2008 or even going back further, but let's just use the 2008 example. Since that point in time, the right thing for stock market investors to do has been to quote unquote, buy the dip. You have always been rewarded for it. And it's my belief that we actually hit a very important peak in December of 2021, that that's a top that will not be exceeded, although, you know, I could be proven wrong pretty quickly here. <laughs> but that's it's my belief that that was a meaningful top. And 2022 was kind of a return to normalcy as this, quote unquote, everything bubble comes unwound as a result of the fact that money is no longer free and the Fed has pushed interest rates up, you know, 5.25 percent, you know, from effectively zero. And um and so you saw the beginning of that in 2022. Um, but then, of course, we've had a, a bounce back rally. And I think what, what everyone's seeing or believing is the Fed is done. Uh, that was, that's as high as rates are going to go. And the next thing will be accommodation. And the Fed has our back and inflation's coming down. And we're going to go back to the conditions that we had pre-COVID, which is, you know, a deflationary world with good growth. And I mean, growth driven by debt, but, but all the same growth. And um, and that's that's why, you know, people are willing to take a punt on stocks in this climate. Um, I personally think they're wrong, but but I've been wrong plenty of times and, and, and they may be right. I mean, I've often said I think they're kind of two. I think they're kind of two binary outcomes here. I think one binary outcome is they do ease, ease very aggressively and the market goes much higher and almost in a crack up boom kind of style, you know, heavy inflation and, and very much. You know, I mean, if you consider companies that countries that have had very, very high inflation, they also tend to have their stock markets go up because stocks do provide some protection from inflation. Um, or, you know, I think that, that you know, things start to break very substantially and that in spite of them printing, turning and printing, which I have no doubt they will have to do and they will do, um, you know, the, the, the unwinding of this credit bubble continues and we have an enormous market correction and, and, and a very, very bad economy. So... Um, you know, they're, and they're pretty, they're two pretty extreme things. And I say, I say that because, you know, what's gone on in the last few years has been extreme. I mean, we, you know, we created in the U S the M2 money supply grew 42% in two years in response to the COVID shock. So, and that's what created the, you know, the 9% annualized rate, you know, and that was underreported, but the 9% annualized rate of inflation. So, um, you know, sadly, uh, you know, I, I think the fed is kind of out of control. And I'm not sure uh, they got a tiger by the tail here, and I'm not sure what they're going to do with it. <laughs> so I, that's kind of long winded, but that's my big picture overview. Yeah, it's wild times. And just going back to what you just said about the COVID shock, do you, what do you think would have happened if they hadn't have printed at that point? Let's imagine that the COVID shock never happened. Where do you think we'd be today? Oh, I think it'd be. I think the market would be much lower. I think the economy would be in a very severe recession. I mean, I think um, you know, look, they they've continued, you know, cheap money and balance sheet growth on the part of the Fed and growth of the money supply is what's kept this economy going. I mean, it's in a in a system where it takes debt to grow and your debt is growing more rapidly than your GDP, you know, you have to continually keep the, the wheels turning. And the only way to do that is to keep the cost of capital very low and or to inject, you know, to intervene in the markets to inject money. And I think that intervention is something that's likely to occur this round, this next round, uh, because now they, you know, they could do it effectively before COVID because the, um, you know, the inflation prints were under 2%. So the notion that, hey, we're printing money and we're growing the balance sheet and we're keeping rates low. Well, 
that's fine. That's all good. When your inflation's low, it all works. You know, and that was what the MMT crowd was about. Hey, don't worry about it. You know, we got to keep the system going and inflation is low. Well, that's no longer the case. Inflation is not low anymore. Inflation is quite high or was quite high. It's coming down a bit, although all the numbers are cooked. It doesn't really matter. But but and, and as a result of that change in the backdrop on inflation, they've now got a problem, which is if they go back to the printer and the low interest rates and the stimulative stuff that they did in COVID, inflation is going to take off again. And so they're they're really kind of caught in a pickle where, you know, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. If they if they don't print, the economy is going to collapse because the debt can't be supported uh, with the amount of money that's in the system. And if they do print, they're going to have, you know, and drop rates low, they're going to have, a, you know, money supply is going to continue to grow and they're going to have massive runaway inflation. And so, you know, both of those outcomes are bad and it's difficult to know exactly when they're going to print. Um, and they've been pretty good at pretending like they won't. But we all know they will because mathematically they have to. And I think politicians, when pushed to the wall, would rather have inflation than an economic collapse. And so if the choice are those two things, you know, my sense is they will pivot and print. Yeah, I think so too. I'm kind of just waiting now to see what the narrative is going to be. It feels like there has to be another narrative, the same as with what happened in 2020, something big enough to scare people to get them to accept the print because otherwise people will start pointing the finger. They'll say, well, you, you just printed all this money. So that kind of has to be something I that agree. arrives. I, and agree. Th I thought maybe the I wall agree. was that, Lawrence. I, I agree. I think that's very possible. I think possibly a war is a part of it. I mean, I also think they're trying to do a little bit of covering their tracks. I mean, you know, they the, the inflation numbers are all made up, but they have, you know, even the made up numbers have come down somewhat from, you know, nine <laughs> to three, four. And, um, you know, and so they'll, and, and you've got mainstream economists saying, well, maybe three is acceptable. We don't need to get to two. Um, and, um, you know, you'll, you'll have, you'll have various narratives, I think. And, and I think at some point they will say, look, folks, we got to live with a little bit of inflation to keep the economy going. I mean, politicians and the central banks, I think, tend to respond to whatever the loudest cries are. And obviously, you know, a year and a half ago, you know, inflation was raging. And so, you know, they had to slam on the monetary brakes, which they did. Um, you know, inflation is still high, but I, my suspicion is they'll find a way to, to rationalize it. And, you know, you have to remember, I mean, these people are kind of professional liars. I mean, they told us inflation was transitory. It wasn't. They told, you know, I mean, everything they said, you know, Bernanke, way back in when in, in 08, said he was going to shrink the balance sheet back down to a trillion dollars. Well, how's that going? We're at, you know, eight trillion today. So, I mean, they, you know, they will just keep shifting the narrative to suit their purpose and their purpose is to keep the system alive so that they can benefit from it and you know take advantage of all the rest of us who have to live with the inflation yeah and given the rate of change of interest rates the past year and also the tightening by commercial banks of their lending standards and the availability of commercial loans to uh, business how wrecked are balance sheets right now and how solvent is the banking sector well, that's a great point. I mean, you know, so I one of the things I think is going to force them to pivot is what I call rivets popping, you know, things breaking. I mean, the, so the Fed has three mandates, right? The, the, you know, full employment, we kind of got that, although they've defined away all the unemployed people as, as not being in the workforce. Um, low inflation, they failed dreadfully at that. And the third mandate that they don't, it's not in the congressional you know, record, but but it's known to be true because we've seen how they behave, is functioning financial markets. And so, you know, when the financial markets start to break or not function, like as an example, in March of 2020, they come in with bazookas of money, you know, to, to solve the problem. It just And they did this, you know, in 2008, and they did this in, you know, 1998, well, 2002, after the dot-com bubble burst. And so what we, what we saw is we had one of these big rivets pop in March when Silicon Valley Bank failed, a few other banks as well. And... Um, you know, and they, but they, they patched that up. I mean, they created a swap line with this BTFP and uh, BTFT, and they, um, um, they also did a, uh, a federal home loan bank, you know, advanced a lot of things to the banks. But, but my studies of it and, and other, you know, economists have studied it and show that the U.S. banking system is in a lot of trouble. Um, and at the time, they were even talking about, you know, they were afraid of runs on the banks, and Janet Yellen was talking about maybe guaranteeing all the deposits. Well, that would be a big step. I mean, the U.S. banking system has $17 trillion of deposits. And now they're not all bad, but um, but the point is that that's a big number, you know, compared to a Fed balance sheet of $8 trillion. And, um, and the FDIC, which is the insurance that protects all those depositors in the United States, is a couple hundred billion. 
So it's the, the FDIC money is woefully inadequate if a lot of our banks get in trouble. And the, the, the charts I've seen, the statistics I've seen suggest that there's about a $600 billion hole in, in a lot of these bank balance sheets, and that's cumulative. Um, and that, you know, if, if you were to take that market across all the commercial banks in the United States, maybe half of them are in trouble, um, you know, i.e. they have negative equity. So I, I don't think they've entirely put the banking system problem to rest. Now, it's going to take more time to play out because a lot of the problems those banks are having is with commercial real estate. They've loaned to property developers in the United States all across the country. And you're seeing some amazing statistics. I mean, there was a on Twitter recently, sometime in the last week or so, there was a there was a building in St. Louis that I think at one point was worth 120 million and it was up for auction and the starting bid was two and a half million dollars. Um, now, I don't think it's sold that low, but my point is that there's, there's a lot of pain in commercial real estate land for a number of reasons. One, the economy has slowed down. Two, you know, people are now working from home and Zoom has, has changed the need for commercial real estate. But three, you know, we just had overbuilding as a result. And this is really the biggest thing. This is the biggest, the biggest underlying problem that's going on in the world in the economy right now, Mike, is that 0% interest rates from 2008 to 2015 and then or 16 and then a break and then, a, you know, pivot and zero again in 2018, 19 and then, and then a slight break and then a pivot again in, in 2020. 0% interest rates have massively, massively distorted all financial asset valuations, you know, because people went out and they took on debt to buy yielding assets. And it was just, it was classic in Austrian economic terms, it was classic malinvestment. They made bad investments that did not, I mean, if you could borrow money for free and get a 5% yield and do that, lever it up and do that infinitely, you know, you could become well wealthy, you know, as long as you could continue to borrow the money for free, but you can no longer borrow the money for free. And so when that changed, the financial world changed. And I think that the markets have not fully accounted for that. I mean, the, the you know, Fed began raising in February of 2022, as I recall. And so we're not that deep into it. I mean, we're, you know, 18 months into this, this campaign of tighter money. And, you know, it takes a little time for things to flow through the system. So, so to my way of seeing it, there we have serious structural pain to come in terms of financial asset valuations, you know, in the next several years. Yeah. Oh, well, I hope we make it several years, Lawrence, but I'm not so optimistic <laughs> on that one, to well, be honest. Yeah. I mean, the war stuff really, really bothers me. I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, I just pray that, you know, that cooler heads prevail and we don't figure out, you know, a way to, to ramp up and increase you know, the tensions and the wars. I mean, the last time I checked, you know, most Americans don't want to kill, you know, Russians or Ukrainians or, you know, Chinese people or anybody really. And and, and I think a lot of the people in those countries don't want to kill Americans. And so I, I don't see a need for additional wars, but sadly the people who run the system, you know, actually benefit from these wars. And that's that's tragic, but that that is, you can observe that to be true. And so they, they happen. Yeah, it's hard because, it, it, you know, you think back when you look at the history books, what it must have been like to live through the 1930s. And you you imagine, like, how could people have sat back and seen it happen? And yet we're all sat back watching the exact same thing happen. It is it, it's, just the same. It's just the same. It's exactly the same. The parallels are so, so exact. Yeah, you're, you're, it's, a, it's a great observation on your point. And so many people miss it. And a lot of stock investors really miss it. You know, a lot of people in the stock market, I mean, they got in and they haven't been in it for a bunch of cycles. I got in in 1981. So I've seen ups and downs. And you know, the fact of the matter is that um, this period we're in now looks a lot more like, you know, the 1929 bubble that burst in the 1930s than it does, you know, current. I mean, you've got to go back in your history. You've got to have a wider lens when you're looking at, you know, what's going on in financial markets. Because, um, you know, the last 10 years, I mean, we've had 15, well, we have 40 years of deflation. But, you know, we had since 08 and even before that, we've had a, we've basically had a, a roaring bull market you know, in financial assets as a result of all the ZERP that I was talking about. And that's not normal. I mean, people think it's normal. People who, you know, anybody who hasn't been in the market, you know, um, who's been in the market since 08, they, they consider these conditions to be normal. And I can assure you that from, if you take a broader look at history, they're not normal. Um, so. Do you, do you think there is a way to inflate our way out of this, Lawrence, that they could uh, somehow do a controlled hyperinflation or because it feels to me like 
Uh, we know on the other side, the debt deflation, that's just going to, that would end the system and they'd have to reset right. it. But is there a way to inflate your way out of this, do you think? Or do you think it leads to the That's a really great place? question. And a lot of smart people have looked at that and thought about it. One guy I follow a lot and I have a lot of respect for is Luke Groman, um, who's a good macro analyst. And, you know, I think the, I think the answer is yes. I mean, so so let's look at a comparable situation. In World War II, um, the U.S. had the same level of debt to GDP, roughly 130, because we borrowed a ton of money to, to win the war. And um, and what they did coming out of it was they put in yield curve control and they forced, the, you know, they said, we're not going to pay more than two and a half percent on the long bond on all our bonds and bondholders. You're going to just have to live with it. And they had a lot of inflation in the early years, some, some years in the double digits in the teens. Um, and, and, and they also had a lot of growth. I mean, the the, the you know and, but but you know in that period bondholders got killed and and yes they they kind of inflated their way out of it until debt to gdp came down to a much more reasonable number in the 30 40% range so so the answer is yes there's kind of a model that where we've done that before um this is a little bit different to world war 2 that that situation though because in that situation you know we were the only healthy economy in the world japan and and germany were in ashes and we had all these GIs coming back and they, they got married and had kids and bought houses and bought cars and bought stuff. And so we had a lot of economic growth as a result of, of in that time frame. And so a combination of holding interest rates artificially low plus economic growth led to, you know, we reinflated our way out of the situation. Sadly, the demographics right now are the other, other way. We don't have a lot of young people. We got a lot of old people. We got a lot of boomers in the States and, um, and there's, so the economic growth is, is, you know, much lower and there's, and there's not a need, you know, to, to rebuild, you know, post World War II. I mean, in that time frame, America was exporting all kinds of stuff to all the countries that have been devastated. So, so it's different, but, but yes, we could, I mean, if we had, you know, Groman has calculated, if we had 15, 20% inflation for five or six years, which would be brutal, um, we could eventually, you know, uh, get out of it by, you know, kind of inflationary growth. I mean, arguably if the government were to do, were to go in and do all kinds of infrastructure and other sorts of reshoring programs, bringing our manufacturing base back from China, you know, we could grow our way out of it. It'd be very inflationary, but it's a possibility. Um, the sad thing is I, on all of these possibilities, I don't see any intelligence or leadership out of, out of you know, the people in Washington, D.C. So, you know, um, so I think that, you know, that you, I think your next question might be, well, then what's going to happen? And the answer is, I don't know. None of us do. Um, but a couple of possibilities. One is this just keeps getting worse and worse. And I believe that this decade is going to look like the 70s. We're going to have more inflation over time. And there, it's going to come in waves. We just had the first wave. It backed off a little bit. The Fed will pivot. They'll say it's under control. They'll pivot. We'll have another wave and it'll go higher. Um, maybe they'll try and tighten that and you know we'll have a down wave. But it, you know, it, I, I think we live, we, we no longer live in a deflationary world. We, you know, we, Technology is deflationary for sure, as Jeff Booth says, but, you know, in terms of commodities and, and other things, it's an inflationary environment right now because of the supply chain problems, because of the underinvestment in this whole area. We, we had a 40-year deflationary run, and for a while now, that's over. I mean, at least five or 10 years, in my opinion. So, um, you know, I think we're going to have high levels of inflation, and arguably, if it gets out of control, it could turn into super high inflation, maybe even, quote-unquote, hyperinflation. Um now, there's a way to stop all of that, and that is to do what Roosevelt did in a slightly different fashion, and that's what I would call a monetary reset. You know, it's, it's, it's at some point in time, you know, if inflation is a problem and it doesn't seem like it can be solved, and we can't solve it with a Volcker solution, which is put interest rates up at 20%, because if we did that, you know, the entire world would go bankrupt. Um, the alternative solution is for the U.S. federal government to say, okay, you know, we're going to return, we're, we're going to do a one, we're going to take a big one-time hit and we're going to return to a sound money standard. And we're going to peg the dollar to gold, we're going to peg the dollar to oil, we're going to peg the dollar to Bitcoin. And, um, and of course, there'd be enormous inflation on that peg. But, you know, the, the U.S. government has 261 million ounces of gold, um, the Treasury. And um, Treasury could say to the, uh, the Fed, Fed has it, and the Treasury could say to the Fed, hey, Fed, write that gold up to $20,000 an ounce and at, at, you know, for every $4,000 an ounce is a trillion dollars. And so that would create, you know, say arguably $17 trillion of cash 
that they would then give to the treasury and the treasury would then pay down the debt, half the debt, and we'd be back to a debt to GDP ratio that would be normal. Now, in so doing, the price of everything would go up hugely once. But but on the other side of it, the you know, if they were willing, if they then stood willing to exchange gold for dollars and they, you know, balanced the budget, um, there would no longer be any go forward inflation and we'd be back on a sound money standard. And so I would submit that that is a more fair and less painful way than to let us go all the way to full fledged hyperinflation, which I, I kind of feel like is, is a possibility and, and maybe even mathematically a likelihood if they don't do a monetary reset. So that, that's kind of how I see it. Yeah, I think you just laid out a, a horror movie for us all. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, sadly, though, we live in this damn horror movie. I mean, we you do. know, the, the flip of it is, the flip of it is, you know, we're just going to have a lot of inflation. So, you know, I mean, the average family is just getting squeezed beyond belief, right? I mean, and um, yeah, so it's, you know, it, it's it's bad either way. Um, and so my sense is that, you know, the better I, I look forward to getting to the other side of this broken monetary system, because I think when we do, there's no there's no law that says the world has to be a bad place. There's no law that says we have to live with inflation. There's no law that says we have to have these problems. I mean, it's, it, you know, this is cause and effect. If we go back to sound money, I mean, look at the countries, for example, that have had hyperinflation. Generally speaking, when they do it, when it happens, they then return to some form of sound money and they actually recover. Things get better. So there's, there's, a, reason to be, there's a reason to be optimistic here. But, you know, sadly, it's not, you know, this, we're in a storm. And we got to get through the storm. The storm's got to pass. We got to get back to a sound money system. And then we won't be in the storm anymore. And things will be quite good, in fact. I, I think, you know, look at what's going on in the world technology wise. God, there's so many wonderful developments. And, you know, if we can make this is a fourth turning, I'm sure you're familiar with the phrase. If, if we can make it through this fourth turning, you know, without blowing each other up and lobbing nuclear weapons at each other, you know, I, I think there's a great world on the other side of it, a really great world. So, but I think we, that's, a, you know. that's a hopeful message, Lawrence. Uh, and you know, I live in one of those countries. We had a hyperinflation here in 1990, and Poland's had the highest growth in Europe for about a decade plus now. You know what I mean? So, uh, on the other side of that, it had a period of massive expansion and growth, and it kind of re you know reset everyone's bank balances for sure. My my parents in law tell me about how difficult it was. However, the country is now the strongest grower in Europe. So there are right. You well, know, there's, 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 there's a there's a perfect example. I wasn't I wasn't super familiar with that example, but that's a perfect example. I mean, they went back to a sound standard, and things got better, right? Yeah, yeah, and um, the definitely proponents of gold have been buying a lot over the last five ten years. But actually, going back to what you were saying, you know, it almost feels like China, Russia, and some of the I mean, if we look at China's supposed gold holdings rather than their official, it almost feels <laughs> like they did put the U.S. in checkmate as well saying, well, if you're going to go back to revaluing the gold to get yourself out, that's also going to... It's going to have a lot it's, of it too. Yeah, yeah it's, going to, it's going to raise China up. So I, I imagine if I was working in the US, if I was a Henry Kissinger of the modern day, I'd be thinking, well, I don't want to go back to gold because it's going to put China in a very powerful spot too. Well, you're very smart to observe that. And you're, right, and you're also correct. China has a lot more gold than they say they have. We know that because we can see the records of what's been shipped to them from Switzerland. And we know they don't export any of their gold. They mine gold themselves. They keep it all in, in country. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's Jason Lowry's argument, right? So Jason is, you know, a, a Bitcoiner, MIT guy who now works for the U.S. military in the Pentagon. And his his thing is, you know, we're going to go back to a sound money standard. If you want to get on a geopolitical chessboard, you know, and, and, and be a Kissinger like God and figure out who the winner is going to be, the winner is going to be Bitcoin. And, you know, we, we believe, I'm not sure I... 100% believe this, but generally speaking, I believe that Russia and China are behind us on Bitcoin. And, you know, if the U.S. were really wanted to make a strategic leap um, over and above those two countries, um, you know, returning to a Bitcoin standard was, would be strategically smarter than returning to a gold standard. Um, but, you know, we'll have to see. I mean, it also would depend, by the way, on the issue of you know, earlier I said we have 261 million ounces of gold in the United States. Well, we 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 allegedly <laughs> have 261 million ounces of gold in the United States. I mean, there's there are a lot of people in the gold circles who, um, and myself included, who, who believe that there's a decent chance that we don't really have all of that anymore. That we've 
swapped or sold or, or you know looted some of that and that we don't have what we claim we have so i mean with the, with the, the u.s government you know as we as we've seen you can't always trust them and that gold hasn't been audited since the 1950s so um so yeah but it's a it's a super interesting point you know what kind of sound money do we return to right yeah it's interesting and uh yeah i just would wonder what that would look like too would they be willing to give up so much power to ordinary citizens who already have accumulated those assets i mean if people have accumulated all the bitcoin they have i know there's still whales out there and there's these two million coins that supposedly have not never been moved but yeah i just wonder how if a central bank would ever be willing to take that kind of gamble that would well, allow the people to have that power no i mean I, look i think the answer is absolutely not i mean the central banks want to keep kicking the can and keep the system the way it's going i mean that's you know, and and the and most of the powers that be, and I mean, the world is run by people who have gotten wealthy off of fiat, and they are going to defend fiat to the last in most in most cases. Um, however, you know, the system is starting to spin and come in, you know, and become uncontrolled, and and in the process of that happening, you know, it's going to be you know every man for themselves, and you're going to see people defecting. I mean, you know, I find it fascinating that you know Larry Fink, who is a you know the runs who runs BlackRock, is a, an enormous fiat lord, you know, has suddenly decided to jump on the Bitcoin bandwagon, um, you know, and, and so I, I think that, you know, um, they a lot of these people are conflicted and they're going to defend their privilege. And yet, you know, they're not stupid. <laughs> and if they see if they see their privilege, if they see that they've got a losing hand, um, you know, they might think start thinking to themselves, you know, gee, I, I at least ought to hedge my bet or, or maybe I play my hand slightly differently. Um, because, you know, this damn Bitcoin thing is pretty relentless, right? It is. It is. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not not necessarily a proponent of Bitcoin myself because I'm extremely suspicious of its origins. But uh, yeah. these are crazy times. And I think the solutions are going to be even crazier. <laughs> like, I have no idea where yeah. it all goes. I mean, my, my take is more of a, I, I guess I go for the, the, the doom and gloom take of that. I think the system gets brought down and reset, controlled demolition, call it what you want. Uh, but I'm not doom and gloom in the long term. I think that will spare a, a, a revival in people going back to taking care of themselves. And that in itself could push us towards this uh, harder money where people just say, listen, we're not going back to that system. Like, we're, like and we're not going to have your laws or your CBDCs. We're just not doing it. But yeah, yeah I think it's going to be very tough for a lot of people, Lawrence, particularly people who are not ready for it. I think the people who are, who are smart are, are getting positioned for that as well as yeah. the possibility that it does survive. I mean, just going back to one thing you said about the 1970s in the UK, that was a great a decline over the 10 years than it was yeah. during the Great Depression, you know, in the stock oh, market. Yeah. Yeah, However, brutal. nominally it went up. So people at the end of the decade saw a 50% gain, and that's a crap return for a decade maybe, but they, they said, well, at least it's gone up. However, in actual <laughs> value terms, it had gone down about 70%, but they didn't yeah. know it because on the paper it had gone up. So I think we could see, I think people would rather see that, even though it was... The Great Depression absolutely. was our worst. Um, absolutely. I mean, look, I mean, people feel good when the value of their house is going up. I mean, it may not really, it's the same house, and it may not, in real terms, it's not going up at all, and arguably it's even going down. But yeah, people, I mean, and that's and that's the beauty of Keynesianism from a Keynesian's point of view. You know, everyone likes to see number go up. And if you're printing money and you're inflating, number will go up, you know, but, um, it, you know, I like to look at things in number of hours worked or number of gold ounces it costs to buy it or number of barrels of oil it's worth. I mean, you know, when you use a, a measure that can't be printed, gold, oil, you know, labor, whatever it might be, I mean, an hour is an hour, um, you know, it's you, you see the fallacy of, of these growing Keynesian numbers, right? Yeah, it's just like they're going to half half the value of the double the digits and half the value of it all again. And you can do that so many times. But exactly. I mean, how long I mean, do you do I, it for, Lawrence? Like, at what point does that... I mean, how long do you think realistically we could do that for before this thing just falls apart? Yeah, that's a great question. I think about that all the time. And I'm, I I should say, first of all, caution, I'm always wrong. So, But I'll give you... You know, you ask me my opinion, I'll give it to you. <laughs> never in doubt. Often wrong, but never in doubt, right? Uh, you know, it feels to me like um, we've got a couple of more doubles in it. And it feels to me like this all kind of comes to a head in 2030, which is about seven years from now. Um, and I say that because fourth turnings tend to take about 20 years. And this one, I think, started in 08. 
Um, I also say that based on the slope of the curve uh, of, of kind of the growth of inflation and the, you know, the devaluation of the dollar. Um, you know, it's, and I say that because the other side has a lot of weapons and a lot of tools and a lot of policy moves and they will continue to fool a big piece of the pie. I mean, I think they've, right now, today, my best guess is they probably fooled 90% of the population. Maybe even more, I don't know. But, let, but let's be charitable and say maybe 10% of the population is where you are and I am and, you know, the sound money camp. And we kind of get it. We're like, look, you guys, you're lying to us. We know you're inflating the shit out of this stuff. And, you know, we're going to protect ourselves by buying sound money stuff. And we just, we know this is wrong. And we know where this is going. I'd say, you know, to me, it feels like 10% get it today. Maybe it's less. Um, it'll be all over when 90% get it. Right. That's that's Gresham's law. Everybody and their brother goes, you know, dollar. What are you kidding me? That thing's worthless. I mean, look at all the value. You know, it's 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 like um, and by the way, you know, it's not a good parallel here. Mike. It's not like this hasn't happened in other countries. I mean, this is happening today in Turkey. This is happening today in Argentina. This happened you know, a few years ago in Venezuela. This happened in Zimbabwe. This happened in Weimar. You know what we're talking about, massive currency depreciation. That model, we've seen that model before. We just have never really seen it at the world reserve currency U.S. dollar level, because in general, this was a you know since World War II, we were kind of the leading country with all the guns and all the power. But but I think that's what we're going to see. And um, so you know, my sense is that with every wave of inflation, more and more people will start to realize, hey, I got to protect myself. I, I can't have bonds. I can't have dollars. I can't be saving in even stocks to a degree, because um, they, they, you know, they, yeah, they're going up nominally, but in real terms, they're not going up. Even my house, I mean, at least your house, you can't print a house, but, you know, you've got costs associated with it, property taxes. So, and so the the trigger, what, what the, the things I watch, you know, and I, I know my friend Brent Johnson always talks about the dollar milkshake theory and how the dollar goes up against all of the currencies. He's right. The dollar is the best currency, but that's not really what's important. What's really important is the price of gold, the price of silver, and the price of Bitcoin. Because to me, those are the alternative monetary choices that individuals can make in order to protect themselves against the debasement of the purchasing power and the continual printing of money. And, you know, um, as long as those are at or near or making all-time highs, and gold is not at an all-time high in U.S. dollar terms, but it's pretty close. It's within 5%. Silver is way off its all-time high. Bitcoin's half of its all-time high. But you know, as we see those things continue to make all time highs, that will be your signal. That will be your clue. Hey, you know, this dollar is just and 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 so more and more people, it's like, you know, Hemingway is slowly than all at once. More and more people will abandon their bonds, abandon their dollars and say, give me that thing which protects me. You know, give me that sound money asset. And when everybody says that and literally nobody's willing to hold dollars and people get paid and the minute they get their paycheck, they turn around and convert it into gold, silver or Bitcoin, you know, very much the way. And if you read the history of the Weimar Republic, you know, people would get paid in the morning and they try and buy shit before the afternoon because they knew the prices would be up the next day. I mean, when, when, and that's that's kind of the maximum point of Gresham's law. You know, Gresham's law is bad money you know, drives out good. Um, and uh uh, or good, yeah, I may have it backwards, but basically people hold, they hold the good money and they spend the bad money. And when, as that, as that happens, I mean, as that becomes more and more apparent, you know, eventually everyone says, you know, this dollar is worthless. I mean, you can go to Venezuela today and you can find their old currency. I mean, people use it, they burn it for fire, they start a fire. I mean, it's, it's worthless. It's, you know, it takes trillions and trillions and trillions of that currency to be worth a few pennies. And so, so that's a that's a total currency collapse, a total loss of loss of faith in fiat currency, and it's hyperinflation. And and I think I think that can and probably absent an intervening force in terms of the reset that I talked about earlier, I think that's where we're headed. Now, like you asked the question, you know, how many more doubles? Feels to me like we get there between 2030. I mean, absolute outside would be 2035. You know, I mean, just based on studying history and looking at the curves. You know, it, it could happen a lot more quickly. Some people think it will. I, I don't know. I just don't know. I guess that'd be a that'd be an extremely difficult uh, ten years as well. I mean, I'm trying to draw parallels from my parent and parent in law experience because they 
they've told me that, you know, exactly what you just said, Lawrence, when they got paid, they said everyone walked around with their life savings in the back pocket waiting just in case there was something they could buy on the street. You know, and my, my father-in-law, I've said it a few times on my channel, but I'll tell you, he once queued for an entire week to get out to, on the rumor that he'd be able to buy an old washing machine. Like That's how desperate they were to get out of cash. And they would do cycles in the queue. So he'd do 10 hours, then he'd go work, and then his cousin would come do 10 hours, and they'd just keep swapping. They did that for an entire week. Oh yeah, just to and wait, just just to wait to buy a washing machine. The rumor wow. that there was going to be a washing machine, nobody knew if it was going to be there. <laughs> and then they got to the front, they did buy it, but then the guy told them there might be another one coming, so they went and did it again for another week. <laughs> oh my so goodness, that's, that's what people did to get great. out of it. Now, do you think people in the U.S. could handle a, a future like that? Well, no. I mean, I think you know, frankly, I think it it would be pretty ugly, and and I think that you know. Um, I mean, if you want to read, you know, kind of the dystopian view of what might happen, a book that I I, I kind of recommend, although I recommend it cautiously because it's 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 dark, is called uh, The Mandibles uh, by Lionel Shriver, and it's it's the story of an American family that lived through the collapse. I mean, she she portrays the collapse of the American currency in the 2040s or something, and. You know, I read that book, and I as I was going through it, I kept I'd turn a page, I'd read some more, and I. Oh shit! Yeah, that could happen. Oh shit! Yeah, that could happen. And you know, it, it was pretty dark, to be frank. Um, I think the government, you know, I, I think as we get into that kind of problems and and really really serious inflation, I can't imagine that some combination of leadership, the military, the government, and the people wouldn't rise up and demand that we do a monetary reset to a sound money standard. I mean, that's that's my hope and belief as to what would occur. But, you know, the flip of that is they could rise up and demand a dictator who's going to give us, you know, coupons for food and CBDCs. I mean, because people will trade, you know, their freedom for security and hungry people will do anything to be able to eat. So, you know, the I mean, the, the, if, if conditions are bad, you know, I think you're always on the knife edge of, you know, uh, enough good people saying, hey, this is really bad. We got to fix it. And here's how we fix it. And we do it. We reset. And a bunch of other people saying, yeah, this is really bad. And by the way, we got to back this guy over here. And, you know, just because he calls people vermin, um, you know, he's OK. Right. <laughs> and he's not. You know, he's a dictator. I mean, it, it's, um, you know, so it, it's tricky. Right. It's it's tricky. It's It's very you know, this is social science. None of us know how it's going to, no, none of us know, sadly, none of us know how this experiment's going to end. I mean, you know, I will say that, you know, it's not, to me, it's not entirely lost on the no, the notion of, you know, having or knowing people who have farms and, and or having a hunting rifle because, you know, there are a hell of a lot of deer in America. I mean, if, if you look at America, if you read the history of the, the Great Depression, there are a lot of people in America that would have starved if they didn't know how to hunt small game. I mean, there were, you know, there was, I mean, America was just flat on its back. There were no jobs, no money. Everyone's poor as shit. And yet people had to eat. And, you know, guess what? If you had a gun and you could, you know, you could shoot squirrels, you know, squirrels and rabbits and deer, it's not bad eating. I mean, it'll, it'll keep you alive. And in the, in the 30s, that happened. And, uh, you know, I'm not suggesting we're going anywhere that dark or, or near that. But my point is that, you know, I mean, I have a bunch of silver coins um, because, you know, if the ATMs ever stopped working, I'm pretty sure that my local farmer would be willing to exchange, you know, some chickens and eggs for a you know, silver coin, whereas there's a chance he might not want to take that hundred dollar bill, you know. So, um, but that's, you know, those are very extreme and dark places that I, I don't think we'll have to go to. But I, but I do think we're going to have to endure more inflationary pain before these folks fix this shit. Um, and and I and I'm looking for people who understand what the problem is. And therefore have a chance of standing up and saying, hey, this is how we fix this shit. And sadly, there's not a lot of that around. There's some of it, just a little bit. So, Yeah, I tend to agree on the on the short term as well, Lawrence, that I think at some point we'll have, I personally feel there'll be a big pullback maybe in the next few months even. Uh, and on the other side of that, they'll print again. So even in that short term, I guess there is opportunities to be had, even if the long term turns out to be a reset or something far darker. Uh, and how how are you setting up for that, Lawrence? I mean, we spoke about gold, and I guess there's so many 
tailwinds for gold. And then I guess there's, in my opinion, there's probably a headwind in that. They don't want it to break out either because it'll be like the 1960s and the gold pool yeah. where it just, it, it it's a big tell that something's seriously wrong with huge. the currency. Uh, it's huge. They're, they're trying to defend 20, 2,000, 2,100 with their lives. I mean, they're all over it, you know, smothering it with paper. But, I, you know, the physical is the physical and the Chinese are taking delivery of the physical and the rest of the world's taking delivery of the physical. And I, I don't think they're going to be able to hold it down forever. I mean, as you pointed out in 68, the London gold pool collapsed. And that's because at the end of the day, you either have the physical or you don't. And if somebody says deliver it, you know, you got to go find it. And, you know, and we've already, by the way, we've already started to see some cracks in the system. I mean, the Shanghai gold price is trading at a premium, you know, to the Western price. Um and, and that's in part, you know, because of the scarceness of the physical. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, the gold getting through 2070, 2050, 2070 is going to be a big tell. And I, I kind of expect that, that in the next three to six months, maybe even sooner. Um, you know, Bitcoin going up to its old time high will be another tell. Silver breaking through 30 and then ultimately through its old high of 50. That'll be another tell. And, you know, I, I think all of those things are coming. Um, and, and maybe just kind of quote unquote, just got started because in, in the U.S., I mean, it, it, you know, the recent inflation data and, and talks from the Fed governors would suggest that it's and it's widely accepted now in the futures market that Fed's done. They're not going five and a quarter is the peak rate. And so from here, you know, we stay here for a while. Maybe they're saying, you know, higher for longer. Uh, you wait, wait until the economy starts to fall apart. Wait until things start to get bad. You know, my gut is they'll they'll very quickly abandon QT, chop interest rates, restart QE. And then, you know, possibly, you know, even at some point in time, they'll either say based, you know, on the war or based on higher prices, you know, we'll, we'll go back and run that COVID playbook and, you know, we'll start to send you some stimmy checks. Yeah, we know everybody's hurting, but guess what? You know, we're going to, we're going to send every household a check for 2000 bucks. That'll help you out a little bit. Right. I mean, you can just, you can see, you know, all of the all the plays have been played. And so you can see how they'll think and where they'll go. And of course, people will vote for it, not realizing that that's only going to make the inflation worse. But, you know, please send me the check. Right. Yeah, it feels to me like a no brainer investing environment as well. I'm not saying there's that I should caveat that with it. It's one of the riskiest investing, uh, investing it's, environments it's ever. There's never a no brainer investing environment <laughs> in my experience. Yeah, that was probably not the best way of putting it. However, I do think the, the looking at the pa the options open to them is basically they're going to print or the system's going to die. And therefore, we know that they're going to have to debase the currency and we know what works in that environment. Bitcoin will fly. Gold miners will start to fly when gold goes up. Uh, unless they reset it or do something else, that's even more tragic. But in that in that scenario, Lawrence, what does any of it matter? We're all screwed. You need to get on well, get on your farm, get your food grown or something because it's going well, to be the yeah. great I mean, if we have a nuclear war. It's all over. But but yeah, I mean, look, it, yes, I mean, I share I share your view that there are very few things in investing that are very very high probability. You know, I mean, most things in investing are a tough call, and yet, given the constellation of macro events and political events. That we now have, I think, continued money printing and monetary debasement is a very, very high probability, relatively easy call. I mean, the the counter to that that would cause me to be a little concerned about my thesis is if, and and when I say this to anyone who's thinking of investing with me, that they laugh, is if I suddenly saw enormous responsibility coming out of Washington D.C. I mean, if <laughs> if, for example, right, you're going to laugh, right? Yeah. If if suddenly, you know, we're going to close our bases all around the world, we're going to cut the military budget in half, we're going to means test Social Security and Medicare, we're going to force your 401ks, your IRAs to buy the treasury bonds, um, you know, we're going to chop spending to the point where the budget is balanced, and we're going to slowly but surely work off this debt. Well, that would be that would be a different kettle of fish. I mean, it would be you know, it would it would not make my thesis as strong as it is. But, you know, the sadly and, and, and I think realistically, the current constellation in Washington, D.C., I think the odds of what I've just described, that that scenario playing out are quite low. It's, it's one that you wouldn't mind being wrong on, though, I think, Lawrence. If that's the one you're wrong on, oh. then it's one one for your kids and for well, your grandkids. Right. I think it'd know. be better. I think it'd be better for the country. There's no doubt. Yeah. But but that doesn't mean it's what I think is going to happen. No, me neither, and and therefore, yeah, it does. It does feel like there's 
uh, there is a clear path and you know my main thesis is the same so how do you how do you feel people should be positioning Lawrence uh, how do you risk manage in terms of equities in general is it a case of bringing down your position sizing uh sorry your portfolio uh allocation to equities just and start going more into real assets just in case we get it wrong and it does reset I think that's right I mean I think look I if you assume that we are going to have monetary debasement, then the interest rates are really wrong today because the, the, we don't really, first of all, the, the, the inflation statistics are cooked. So there's not really the, the positive real interest rate that they say we have. We don't really have it, in my opinion. Um, you know, to me, probably the real rate today is zero or maybe still even negative. Um, so, so there's a no brainer. You don't own any bonds. I mean, long-term bonds are gonna absolutely get slaughtered, killed, et cetera. They're the worst investment to have in the seventies. Uh, Henry Kaufman, as an economist back then, called them certificates of confiscation. And that's what they are. So the first thing you do is you sell every bond you got that's long dated. I mean, a one-year treasury paying 5%, hey, that's better than zero. And it rolls in a year. And if 5% goes to seven, well, you just roll it and get seven next time. But um, so, so first of all, you don't get into bonds. Second of all, I think the equity market is still quite rich. Um, you know, I get it that, that these tech companies are very highly profitable and don't have, you know, they have great cost structures and all that sort of stuff. And so I understand why people want to own the Magnificent Seven and some of the big tech companies. I, they're not cheap. Um, you're paying up for them. I certainly wouldn't want them to be a big piece of my portfolio, but I understand why people want them in their portfolio. I mean, they are long duration assets with, with moats. Um, beyond that, I think you, you if you're going to be in the stock market, I think you want to aim toward stocks which will benefit from commodity inflation because I think we're going to have a lot of commodity inflation. If you look at the 70s in the United States, the two best performing stock categories were gold stocks and oil stocks because they both were driven by commodity inflation. So, and then, you know, and then beyond that, I think, you know, you want to, if you're just holding cash, I mean, I, to me, gold is a very adequate form of cash. Silver is a good form of cash. Bitcoin is a form of cash. I mean, Bitcoin is quite volatile, but, but to me, they will all benefit from debasement. Um, you know, obviously I'm talking my book here, but I, I manage a fund that's a gold stock mining fund, and it's kind of stunning how cheap a lot of these companies are right now in terms of multiples of cash flow and their future opportunities. I mean, I think I think people have really once again given up on the gold stocks as being dead, and I think they're wrong. I think the market is colossally wrong, and and therefore, you know, when gold does go through twenty one hundred and the sentiment turns, I mean, I think the market can, you know, the 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 variant perception I have. Uh, you know, because if you go to Bloomberg and you look at the five-year out inflation swaps, everyone thinks inflation is going back to 2.6%. Well, guess what? I don't. I think inflation is going to stay where it is and go higher. And so if you think it's going back to 2.6%, then you don't need the stuff I'm talking about. But if you think I'm right, then you do. And because the market thinks it's going to 2.6%, they're leaving gold stocks laying around on the floor. I mean, I have companies trading at two times, three times cash flow. That makes no sense. That's a 33% a 50 to 33% earnings yield. And some of these companies, you know, they have all kinds of leverage to the upside of the gold price. They're going to increase their production, et cetera, et cetera. So um, to me, the, you know, the, the most undervalued asymmetric place to be in the stock market right now is in gold mining stocks um, by, by, by mile. I mean, just by a huge, huge measure. So, um, you know, and that's what my fund focuses on. So, um, you know, obviously a shameless plug, but, but, but I, you know, that's my job is to, is to earn a return for my investors. And I, I try, you know, I do it in two ways. I try and get the macro right, which I think, I hope I have right. And then within that, I try and find the best companies and pick the micro, you know, because frankly, the gold mining business is a tough business. And a lot of the gold, you can't just buy every gold mining stock and the indices contain a lot of crappy stocks. And so what my fund aims to do is to select the best ones. So, so one, I mean, you know, gold miners in general are going to go up, but some are going to go up a lot more than others because the good ones are, you know, primed to do much better than the shitty ones. And so my fund selects what I believe to be the good ones. So, no, I, I completely agree uh, that it's just amazing just that the, some of the prices we're seeing in the junior mid tier miners. Uh, yeah. I mean, they're trading at prices that the last time they were at these prices, the gold price was about 50% less. It's insane. I've never seen it uh, like that. Yeah, However, yep. yeah, there's that risk the of a liquidity event yeah. maybe, but besides the liquidity yeah. event risk right now, otherwise it's it's a huge opportunity knowing what we know about it's currency. It's an amazing opportunity. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why it exists though. I mean, it, you know, 
if you get on Bloomberg and you look at their projections and you, you know they they survey all these investors all over the world, the average you know stock analyst or macro analyst gold price five years out is seventeen fifty. So you know the, the consensus view of the market today is that in five years gold will be one thousand seven hundred fifty dollars an ounce. And if you in turn look at the cost of pulling gold out of the ground today, the average ASIC, it's called all-in sustaining cost, tends to be around thirteen hundred dollars an ounce. And you know, with the price of gold at nineteen fifty, that's a nice margin. You're making you know six fifty an ounce that you're pulling out. But that thirteen hundred is up from a thousand. It's up from eight hundred. I mean, it, that's the thirteen hundred is growing because of labor costs are going up. You know, machinery costs are going up. Explosives are going up. Oil's going up. All the things it takes. So you know, the thirteen hundred in five years will be fifteen, sixteen, seventeen hundred. Well, if you think the price of gold is going to be seventeen hundred in five years, and you think the cost of the underlying pulling it out of the ground, it's going to go up consistently. Guess what? You're eventually going to have a non, uh, uh, an unprofitable business. And so that's what the market is saying. The market for gold stocks is saying, we think the costs are going to keep increasing and the price of the product isn't going to go up. Now, I think the cost will probably continue to increase, although maybe not as fast if we have a recession. But I also think in five years, the price of gold will be between three and $5,000. And so you know there'll be plenty of profit margin when, when we're at those higher prices. Yeah, and I, get, I just can't see people continuing to accept their savings and their pensions getting destroyed without taking some action. I mean, even the most financially ignorant person at some point will just go online and say, what do I do? And that's when they'll figure out you protect yourself with gold. And, you know, maybe the older people won't figure out Bitcoin, but they'll certainly know about gold. It's so simple. They'll just start flooding it's, into it's it. It's totally straightforward. Yeah, I mean, it's, it ought to, gold ought to be the core of everybody's savings program. I mean, it's been money for 5,000 years. It does its job. It's not sexy, but it's gone up 8% a year forever. And that will protect you, you know? And so, you know, whereas the cash you have in your pocket is probably going down at least 8% a year. And in the, the two years after COVID, it went down almost 20% a year in terms of purchasing power. So, you know, it's it's a pretty rough, it's a pretty rough, you know, environment in terms of you know, the level of monetary debasement that we're facing right now. So, yeah, I agree. I Lawrence, it would be remiss of me not to ask this question because I've been doing so many videos on it. Did you read the book, The Great Taking? And if so, what's your thoughts on this kind of extreme yeah, I did. version a, of what could happen? Yeah, it's a, it's a great book. I have a lot of respect for that guy. He did enormous forensic research and analysis of, you know, the issues surrounding all the DTC and all those stock shares. Um, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I so... The word conspiracy theory, I believe, is kind of misused um, because, you know, many conspiracy theories have become conspiracy facts. <laughs> um, and so, you know, with every theory that comes out there, I just treat it as a theory and, and say, what are the odds of this being true or being likely? And um, I don't think that his thesis that they're going to grab literally all the assets in a taking like that. I, I don't think that's highly likely in a society like ours with a certain amount of rule of law. I just think that 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 really crosses over the line. So I, I rate the odds of that happening as being fairly low, not zero, but fairly low. Um, now, maybe I'm giving too much credit to the people who run the system. <laughs> I mean, there, there are a lot of people out there who think that their intent is to drive us into the Great Depression, crash the total system, take everything, make us slaves, put us on CBDC, you know, the whole the whole dystopian, you know, Orwellian nine yards. And it, and you know what? That could be true. I mean, I, I pray it's not, but that could be true. Um, I I just, um, I look at what's going on. I look at the people who run the show. I mean, I think they're pretty evil people. I think they do a lot of bad things, but I don't think they can coordinate that level of evil. I think what they do is bad enough as it is. And to go, to go there is even a couple steps beyond you know, they're just not smart enough to pull that shit off. <laughs> yeah, well, I agree that it would off, fail. They're trying to pull off some shit that's pretty bad, but but not that <laughs> shit, I guess. Yeah, yeah I, th I think it would fail catastrophically. And yeah, it, it doesn't bear thinking about besides uh, risk management. You know, bears, that's the time when you've got to think, well, you know, it's, you've got to put yourself in the shoes, I guess, of all potential scenarios and even that scenario. So it's, I guess it's a case of can I create a portfolio that will be useful for me now, but also protect me somewhat from well, that. Well, and I think you brought up something that's really, really important, which is the, the concept. We live in a very uncertain world. We're in a fourth turning. All kinds of shit's going on. Who would have predicted COVID? Who would have predicted, you know, printing they've done? I mean, who would have predicted any of this shit, right? And, you know, now we've got people... Only a conspiracy theorist. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I and mean, now we got people rattling sabers. I mean, you know, for all we know, World War III could break out. I mean, I think there's a really sound argument to be made for just a lot of diversification, a lot of different buckets. I mean, I think owning a farm would be great. I think owning firearms is an essential. I think owning gold is important. I think owning silver is important. I think owning some Bitcoin is important because of this asymmetric upside. You know, I think being close to your source of food is important. Um, you know, I mean, I, I can make an argument that having a second passport and avoiding certain countries might make sense. I mean, we don't really know what's going to happen. And I'm not suggesting anyone panic and I'm not trying to be a doomer. I'm just saying that in an uncertain environment, I mean, you know, as an example, I, I know people who have all of their wealth in stocks. I think they're insane. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I think they're literally insane. You know, that, that, that how could you possibly do that? Um, you know, you've got to have diversity in what you're in what you're doing because you just don't know how the cards are going to get turned over. Yeah. And I think you've I think you've always put out great content, Lawrence, All along that I theme. Think... What you put out is smart. You know, it's not just saying 100 percent here or you're or it's all gold mining stocks and you do get people like that. And it's kind of zero risk management once you're going down that path and. Zero. I mean, I, I, yeah. I always say to people right now, wealth preservation is probably more important than wealth growth. Absolutely. And and everything's just probability weighted. I mean, nobody knows the future with certainty. But, you know, I mean, if you have a little bit of everything, you know, it might surprise you. I mean, and this is why I try and convince gold bugs. I know you said you're a skeptic on Bitcoin. I mean, I think having zero Bitcoin is an enormous mistake because I think that there's a very high probability Bitcoin really is going to work. And I'm not suggesting anybody need to have a ton of it, but I'm suggesting if you don't have between a one and a 10% weighting, you're crazy because this thing could easily be a 10 to 100 to 1000 bagger. And if it is, and you have zero, you're going to have regret. But if you buy 1% of, if you take 1% of your assets and buy a little Bitcoin and it goes up hundred X, well, guess what? You just protected your whole asset base. Do you know what I mean? Even if you don't believe in it. And I agree. So, no, I agree. I say the same. I think it's the speculation to be in uh but it's all about that risk management if someone tells me they've got 20 30 percent i say well that's way more than i would be willing to go of but course it yeah, is. everybody yeah. has their own weighting but i'm saying to have zero you know because you just we just don't know and it has performed very well since inception and you know i can make a case it's going to continue to perform very well but i understand everyone's skepticism with it i get it uh, i'm just suggesting that as an investment risk manager We've got an asset that's performed this well over time. You need to have a little bit of it in your portfolio. And someday you might be very glad that you did. And if you don't, you know, if it does what I think it's going to do, you could wake up someday and think, gee, you know, I heard about that. And they told me to do that. And I never did it. Boy, I, I've got regret. That I didn't buy a little bit of that, you know. Wise words, as always, Lawrence, thank you so much for your time. Is oh, there anything you. else you wanted to cover, Lawrence, before we finish? No, I, I will make a shameless plug, if you don't mind. Go for it, please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Lawrence Lepard. You can follow me. Um, I have a website, ema2.com. Uh, it talks about my fund. We have a quarterly letter that's free. We won't ever spam you. And uh, it's not always the case, but we actually do have openings now in the fund. Um, sometimes we don't, but we had some people get disgusted with gold stocks and leave. Um, and the, the US SEC makes me impose a minimum. So the minimum investor size is $100,000. But... If anyone's interested in joining our fund and has that level of uh, commitment, uh, they can reach out to us. So, Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Lawrence, and uh, hopefully speak to you again in the future. Uh, absolutely. Look forward to it. Thank you.